From the Greenhouse, it's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, episode 64, and today we're going to talk about why I think Chef Gordon Ramsay is the worst. And already, it is crucial for us to consider the distinction between real people and media personas that are based on real people. I despise Gordon Ramsay the media persona. I have little idea how I feel about Gordon Ramsay the human being. I've never met Gordon, though... Because I am a moderately successful internet cook, multiple reality show casting directors have slid into my DMs over the years, inviting me to be ritually sacrificed by Ramsey on one of his programs. Or at least one presumes that's what participation in one of his programs would entail. No one, and I mean no one, is their whole true self when the cameras are on. I am not Adam Ragusea right now. I am, instead... Adam Ragusea, the media persona based on Adam Ragusea, the real person. Adam Ragusea, the media persona, is a semi-fictional character. He's someone we are making up together right now. I cannot claim exclusive authorship of this person. I mean, I definitely do claim it for legal purposes, but in terms of, like, cosmic justice, I have to acknowledge your part in creating the character that is Adam Ragusea. Yes, I seasoned my cutting board long before I ever met you people, but it was you people who turned me into the guy who seasons his cutting board. That's an entirely different guy from who I was before. Gordon Ramsay, the media persona, is obviously based on Gordon Ramsay, the man, but these are not the same men, and we must remember that. Gordon Ramsay, the man, is, by all accounts, a lovely and devoted father, and I reckon that's more important than anything else that we are going to talk about this hour. That said, Gordon Ramsay, the man, is as culpable in the creation of this persona as anyone is. Therefore, Ramsay, the man, bears a lot of responsibility for the harms done by Ramsay, the persona. It is not exculpatory to say, oh, he's just playing a character. He's just a heel, to use wrestling entertainment industry terminology for a highly stylized comic book-esque bad guy, a heel. The problem with Ramsey is that within the warped universe of his television programs, Gordon Ramsey is the face, not the heel. Gordon is always the hero of his own stories, even when he is behaving villainously. Within the Ramsey cinematic universe... The only true villain is incompetence, and Super Gordon is here to brutally stamp out incompetence wherever he finds it, in whomever it resides. Don't worry, young chef. It may feel like Super Gordon is kicking you in the head with his big costume boots, but really, he's kicking the incompetence inside you, a boot stamping on your incompetent face forever. It's like an exorcism. The fada isn't hitting you. He's hitting the demon inside you, and you should be grateful. Yes, chef. Gordon Ramsay is an elder Gen Xer, a demographic category that is less significant here in the United States than it is in Britain. To be a Gen Xer in Britain was to spend your formative years amidst the grim toil of post-war economic reconstruction. And then just as you're striking out on your own... Margaret Thatcher gets elected prime minister and she says, the problem with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. And she rolls back the welfare state. And if you're a Gen Xer in Britain, you feel like you've been born into a world that was all used up by the time you got to it. There's a lot of permanently anxious workaholics among the Gen X generation. Gordon was born in 1966 in Johnstown, a small, depressed Scottish mill town west of Glasgow. His mom was a nurse. His dad was a charismatic drunk. Sounds like a sadly typical upbringing. The family moved to the West Midlands of England when Gordon was nine. He says he was a top youth soccer prospect. Association football, soccer. Having spent a fair bit of time around the Brits, as I have, I've discovered something remarkable. I've discovered that apparently 
Nine out of ten Anglo-Celtic men were top-level football prospects as boys. It's really quite remarkable. I guess Gordon actually was a good football player, and his career hopes actually were dashed by a knee injury that he suffered at 16. It's safe to assume that a boy of his socioeconomic class would have seen football as one of the very few paths of advancement available to him, unlikely as athletic stardom is for anyone. Also at the age of 16, Gordon says that he left the abusive family home. Like so many people of his caste, Gordon found menial work as a young adult in the restaurant industry. He has said that his first such job was washing dishes at an Indian place where his big sister waited tables. In his late teens, Gordon apparently still conceived of himself as an upcoming football star, just one temporarily sidelined by a bad knee. He was also, by this point, as you can see in pictures, disgustingly handsome, far more handsome than his womanizing father. Gordon was always handsome in that particularly British way, where no matter how old they are, they look like 52-year-old teenagers. Boris Johnson still looks like a 52-year-old teenager, and I know why that is. It's because Boris is a man-child. I'm less sure why British teenagers all looked 50 years old in the 1980s. It may have simply been that life was a lot harder for post-war British kids than it was for their American counterparts. Money was frequently not available for cosmetic medicine, such as orthodontia or dermatology. Gordon has said that his signature craggy-faced look is the result of untreated teenage acne, though surely there's a lot going on with that face other than acne scars. No acne scar has ever been as deep as some of the crags on that face. Craggy as the cliffs at Clomore. Also, teenage Gordon already had the really tall hair that I believe is called a quiff? I'm guessing he would have absorbed that hairstyle from the new romantic subculture in the UK in the early 80s. I guess it would have read at the time as kind of an ironic throwback to the 1950s teddy boy style in the UK, which was roughly equivalent to the contemporaneous greaser style in the US. That is to say, Gordon Ramsay's tall hair might have originally been a sign of his working class origins, though it is anything but now. But lordy, he was a handsome kid. He looked like a teen idol. Like if Gordon Ramsay could sing, he would have been in Wham. Actually, Andrew Ridgely could not sing and he got to be in Wham. So I guess what I'm really saying is that if Gordon Ramsay had gone to school with George Michael, he would have been in Wham. He was that good looking. And he was apparently a pretty good footballer, as the Brits would say, and so he naturally figured that he was destined for stardom as soon as that bum knee healed. Well, at 19, still working in restaurants, Gordon was persuaded to attend North Oxfordshire Technical College on a scholarship to study what the Brits call catering and us Americans call hospitality, the hotel and restaurant industry. I wonder if a young Brit in the 1980s would have seen cooking as a means of upward mobility. I mean, all the old chefs will tell you that they absolutely did not see cooking as a means of upward mobility. Gordon and Marco and Bourdain and the rest love to talk about what a dead-end job cooking used to be, even at the highest levels. And I'm sure there's truth to that claim, but it still warrants skepticism given how self-flattering it is for a rich guy like Gordon to say, oh, I never intended to become a celebrity. I was just minding my own business behind the stove like any other working class bloke. Then ITV just burst through the door and said, you, you have to be on telly. Surely it has always been the case. Since the invention of socioeconomic hierarchy itself, that if you're a poor nobody and you want to brush shoulders with rich somebodies, then your best bet is luxury domestic work. 
Rich people generally don't hire other rich people to serve their meals because rich people don't want to do that kind of work. Only poor people want those kinds of jobs. And even they don't really want those jobs. They just need those jobs. So if you're poor and you want to wriggle your way into the lives of the rich, you probably won't. But your best bet, historically, was either to fight the aristocracy's wars for them or to cook their meals for them and to empty their chamber pots, etc. England's Tudor dynasty, Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, those guys, right? That dynasty was famously founded by Owen Tudor, a household servant of Catherine of Valois, Dowager Queen. When her husband, Henry V, died on campaign in France, Catherine was left all alone in this world as the beautiful and fabulously wealthy mother of the infant King Henry VI, and her very handsome Welsh manservant, Owen Tudor, was there to comfort her. Owen was right there by Catherine's side, and then gradually made his way around to her front. I stole that joke from the late great Carrie Fisher, who was talking about her father Eddie Fisher's affair with Elizabeth Taylor. He consoled her with flowers, and ultimately he consoled her with his penis. Hilarious line. RSVP Carrie Fisher. Anyway, the fact that domestic servitude brings rich people and poor people dangerously close together has been known for thousands of years. It's why members of the ruling classes would often send their children to go and work as menial laborers in the court of the king. That way, you keep the royal family surrounded by the right kind of people, your kind of people, aristocratic people, the people in the club. If the daughter of a baron is pouring the queen's wine and eventually becomes the queen's best buddy, that is much less threatening to the power structure than if some random handsome young Welshman is pouring the queen's wine. Now we have to have a whole ruling dynasty named after this guy who was most definitely not in the club, Owen Tudor. Point is, if Gordon Ramsay had learned any history at all in school, he would have known that cooking was a viable means of upward mobility. I mean, the odds were slim, but so were the odds of becoming a pro footballer. The son of a drunk from some shitty Glasgow suburb was never going to have great odds in this life. Going to culinary school probably felt to Gordon like a reasonably safe bet that could also, maybe, pay off big. And it did. Because if you want to get in with rich people, one thing you can do is cook them uncommonly excellent food. It helps if you look like a proto One Direction member while you're serving the food. Indeed, here's a story that Gordon likes to tell. Lord knows if it's actually true. But here's the story that he tells. Gordon says that when he was first climbing the ladder in the trade, he had a job running the kitchen at a hotel called the Wickham Arms. And while he was working there, the wife of the owner took a shine to him, and the two commenced an affair that ultimately blew up, and Gordon had to leave and continue his lonely, heroic quest to find fame and fortune and true love somewhere else in the, in the vast wilds of Culture Club-era Britain. I quote now from Gordon's own account of the incident as relayed to 60 Minutes Australia. Quote, You know, what 19-year-old chef, fit as a fiddle, built like a gypsy's dog, is going to say no to a stunning 33-year-old wife of your boss? Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And it was great because all the knowledge she was teaching me in terms of making love, my girlfriend benefited. End quote. Stay classy, Gordon. How exactly is a gypsy's dog built, anyway? Also, you're supposed to say Roma. Anyway, for his part, Gordon's old boss at the Wickham Arms, a gentleman named Paul Waring, he told the British tabloids that he only learned about this affair when Gordon published his braggy autobiography in 2006 called Humble Pie. It's a humble brag, really, to talk about how you started life so down on your luck that you were, you were reduced to sexually servicing the boss's desperate housewife. Wow. 
Gordon Ramsay must really deserve all his fame and money if he started life at such a disadvantage. He's the scruffy servant boy from the castle kitchen who gets swept up in a grand adventure that ends with him becoming king. And on the way, he bones the wife of the corrupt, unmanly, older, previous king. It's a good story. I can see why Gordon keeps telling it to everybody, including himself. It has the advantage of being based on a true story. Gordon Ramsay is based on Gordon Ramsay, after all. For daring to be more virile than the king, heroic young Gordon found himself banished and exiled in the wilderness, a.k.a. London. He worked at a few places and eventually got himself installed as sous chef at Harvey's, a small Michelin-starred place on Wandsworth Common where the head chef was a similarly handsome young go-getter with fabulous new wave hair, also built like a gypsy's dog at this point, which I take to mean skinny. And this other young man was Marco Pierre White. I've talked about Marco many times, but if, if you've not heard, and if you live in the United States, you might not have ever heard of him, Marco Pierre White is often regarded as the first modern celebrity chef. At this point in the story, Marco looked like Jim Morrison in an apron, and he was a total badass. Marco had not yet been to France at this point in his life, but he'd come up in French restaurants in the UK, working for old French chefs who themselves had come up in the rigid, militarized brigade system of running a kitchen, which itself had been created by veterans of the Franco-Prussian War, like Escoffier. Marco came up in kitchens where cooking was war, and he'd internalized the highly misguided notion that leadership equals big-dogging everyone else around you all the time. There was a period of almost three years when young Gordon Ramsay was young Marco Pierre White's sous chef and protege and little brother figure. Both men have written and spoken extensively about their three years together, but even more remarkably, we have footage of them working together at Harvey's because producers at ITV made a couple of very short series about Marco circa 1990, and Gordon is in the background. He's never really named because he was a nobody at the time, but the camera found Gordon nonetheless. The camera is always going to find that face and that tower of blonde hair. Marco famously reduced Gordon to tears at least once, and the toxic big brother-little brother relationship between them practically oozes out of the screen as you watch these two very handsome young men roll out ravioli for the TV cameras. Marco's whole thing was quiet menace. He would rarely boil over in an extravagant rage, as Gordon is famous for doing now. Marco's thing is he would just simmer inside his own skull and glare at you and quietly mutter an absolutely crushing cutting remark about how worthless you are. And maybe if things got real bad, he'd push you up against the wall with a boning knife up to your neck. But even then, he'd be kind of menacingly stoic about it. That was Marco's quiet storm vibe. Hostility masquerading as serenity. Actually, in the case of both young men, it was probably insecurity masquerading as hostility masquerading as serenity. Young Gordon looks like an abused child in this old Marco footage. He looks beaten down. He stands quietly and submissively in the background with his head down until he's called upon to assist his master, at which point he hops right to it, moving with a speed that seems motivated more by fear than ambition. Gordon seems hyper-attuned to Marco's emotional state, as abused people often have to be to survive, right? You can see Gordon changing his affect to match Marco's mood, which would often turn on a dime. But when you watch this footage, you can also see that they are brothers. Gordon is the little brother, for sure, but they are people who share a a fraternal bond nonetheless. 
two people could not lead much more similar lives than these two guys. And I imagine that they helped to reinforce in each other's minds their shared nascent belief that cooking could be cool. Cooking could be sexy. And God, are these two sexy as you watch them roll out fresh ravioli in their lean and hungry 20s. If you're looking for lean and hungry employees who share your vision of sexiness or whatever, hey, consider finding them with Indeed, sponsor of this episode. Check them out in Indeed.com slash Ragusea. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. It's the number one source of hires in the U.S., according to Talent Nest. 81% of U.S. online job seekers search for jobs on Indeed every month, says Comscore. So if you're looking to hire somebody, you don't need to be spending time across multiple job sites. Just stay right there with Indeed and they'll take care of you. With Indeed Instant Match, more than 80% of employers see quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. That's according to Indeed's U.S. data. And once you've zoomed in on someone, you can reach out to them and invite them to apply. That makes people typically three times more likely to apply to your job than if they just found it in a search. Then you can administer virtual assessments to learn more about the candidates. You can do virtual interviews. The best part is that Indeed is the only job site where you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. There's a reason 3 million businesses worldwide use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Ragusea. Offers good for a limited time. Claim your $75 sponsored job credit now at Indeed.com slash Ragusea. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Anyway, the three years when Marco employed Gordon as his number one. There's the famous incident that both Marco and Gordon have written about in their books when they were like neck deep in a brutal service at Harvey's and Gordon made a sauce that wasn't to Marco's standards, so Marco threw the hot sauce at Gordon along with some choice words, and Gordon collapsed into a heap and cried. Marco made the big, tough Gordon cry in the middle of a service. Actually, Gordon made himself cry, Marco later said in an interview. Quote, He made himself cry. That was his choice. No one has the power to make another person cry. The kitchen is a tough place. I just do my job. My reputation is the result of hyperbole and ignorance. Quoth the raven, Marco Pierre White. So you can see where Gordon gets it. I'm not a chef. I've worked in food service, but never in nice restaurants. However, I have been around the restaurant industry long enough to know that it's, it's really similar in lots of ways to the broadcasting industry that I came from. Producing a live daily broadcast with lots of moving parts is very similar to cooking a service. It's usually not as hot or as messy or as dangerous, but the tension level is about as high, and the timing is even more delicate, especially back in the day when we had to constantly dance around totally immovable commercial breaks. When people are mounting a live broadcast, they often yell at each other. I've yelled, I've been yelled at, it's really common. Where's that goddamn tape? I need it in 47 seconds. That was me, as I often used to direct the live broadcasts, which is a role similar to that of like an expediter in a kitchen. Live broadcasting is also similar to cooking in the sense that it feels Sisyphean. You're constantly feeding a beast that can never be satisfied. You pull out all the stops and engage in absurd heroics to pull off the show. And when you do, you're proud of yourself and you can breathe for like five seconds before you immediately have to start worrying about tomorrow's show and it never ends. It's like you're running on a treadmill over a lava pit. You can get off when you die. 
But the other big similarity between cooking and broadcasting and professional athletics is that there's this weird disparity between the tension and the stakes. Like the tension is high, but the stakes are really quite low. It really doesn't matter if the sauce is broken or not. Nobody is going to live or die depending on the state of that particular emulsion. Similarly, if we go to dead air for 30 seconds while we reestablish a dropped ISDN connection to Washington, that's bad, but nobody's going to die as a result. And of course, nobody will live or die as a result of a ball making it into a net. And yet... These work environments are extremely high stress because they are so visible and the competition is so stiff. And they're extremely time sensitive jobs. So you don't always have the luxury of asking for something in a polite tone of voice. I get it. I've been there. But I also know that I yelled a lot in the studio when I really didn't have to. And I was yelled at and reduced to tears many times in the studio, and it really wasn't necessary. And I don't just mean, you know, speaking with a raised voice. There's nothing wrong with raising your voice so that you can be heard, or perhaps so that you can express urgency. When I say yelling, I mean verbally brutalizing people, trying to make them feel bad about themselves, trying to make them feel as though they are worthless. That is the tradition in French-style professional kitchens. Maybe they told themselves it was a kind of good-natured hazing slash tough love training, but really, that kind of yelling is only ever about making the yeller feel good at the expense of the yell e. Yelling is an indication that you have lost control of yourself or your team. If you're in control, you can lead quickly and decisively with your library voice. When the tension rises, use your library voice. There's a big transition going on in the high-end restaurant industry right now, where people who have worked incredibly hard to climb the ladder of this now glamorous trade, those people who killed themselves to get into those kitchens are now pretty sick of eating the shit pie that they got at the end as their reward. The reward for busting your ass in kitchens is more busting your ass in kitchens. 14 hours a day, six days a week, on your feet the whole time, sweating bullets and shouting. Some people want that, okay? Some people just need a war, and they will make a war to fight if none exists. But more people just want a normal life, where they go to work for like eight hours, they do their jobs hard and well, and then they go home to their families. There are people in the elite restaurant industry who want a normal damn life. So I'm seeing a lot of new chefs trying to revolutionize the work environment in the kitchen to make it a job that people actually want to stay in once they've got it. We should talk about that more another day, but... The finest kitchens that I've been in in the last few years were places where everybody used library voices. In the midst of a dinner service, all you hear in the kitchen is spoons scraping the bottoms of pans and the expediter saying, fire table seven, heard, hands. The communications between people in that kind of really well-run kitchen might sound like curt, but they are fundamentally gentle and respectful because everybody is in control of themselves. When things get out of control, when you're overwhelmed and in trouble and the orders are stacking up faster than you can fire them, you don't yell. You calmly inform your colleagues that you are in the weeds. That's an idiom that's used in kitchens and in the broadcasting industry. Like if I'm editing a package for tonight's live show and I'm looking at the clock and I'm thinking, boy, I'm not sure I'm going to make it in time. I tell my colleagues, hey, guys, I'm in the weeds on this package. And they would all immediately rally around me and help me by staying really quiet so that I could concentrate 
and they'd keep any new work from hitting my desk, intercepting all the distractions before they could ever get to me. They might even answer my desk phone for me if it rings, and they might even start working on a contingency plan in case I don't make deadline and they need something else to fill the runtime. I could spark all of that into action just by saying calmly, hey y'all, I'm in the weeds. Really functional teams know each other well enough and they, they know the work well enough that they don't need to yell. Everybody knows how serious it is to be in the weeds. Nobody needs to shout to express the gravity of the situation. We've got it. The way we get out of the weeds is by staying professional. If you're yelling in the workplace and there's no literal explosion going on, that's not a sign of strength. It's a sign of weakness. It means you're out of control. And what powerful person is not in control of their team? Gordon Ramsay, in his years with Marco Pierre White and other abusive a-holes, Gordon seems to have learned the opposite lesson, that yelling equals strength and power and dominance. Marco fancied himself a stern but loving father to his only slightly younger boys in the kitchen, and that's the identity that Gordon absorbed and adopted for himself and turned into an extremely successful TV persona. The first Gordon Ramsay television series remains the best, in my humble opinion, Boiling Point a typically short British series of only four episodes that aired on uh, Britain's Channel 4 in 1999. To understand it, we have to catch up on what happened in Gordon's life after he'd finally had enough of working for Marco. Abusive father that he may have been, Marco also got Gordon his next job, working for the legendary Albert Roux at Le Gavroche in London, Marco had also done some time at the Gavroche. Albert sent Gordon to run a new restaurant in the French Alps. And then Gordon worked in Paris for Joël Robichon. And a couple of years after that, he was totally burned out, as one would expect. He did a year on a yacht as a personal chef. Easy to imagine how a good-looking and witty young man gets a job like that. He came back to London and found himself with multiple big job offers, but he took the one that came from Marco. Marco and his business partners were looking for a new head chef for a new restaurant that became Aubergine, Gordon's first restaurant as head chef and part owner. Sweat equity, one imagines. Gordon racked up two Michelin stars at Aubergine, but his relationship with Marco and partners gradually soured. And in 1998, Gordon struck out on his own and opened Restaurant Gordon Ramsay in Chelsea. Where did he get the money? By marrying well, of course. Tana Ramsay, maiden name Hutchison. Her father, Chris Hutchison, handled Gordon's business, Chris Hutchison did. Never go into business with your in-laws. If it didn't end well for Billy Joel, it's not going to end well for you. So Gordon Ramsay's first starring television series, Boiling Point, chronicles the opening of restaurant Gordon Ramsay in 1998. Gordon's first restaurant that was essentially his own. It was his big shot to finally become a big shot, like his big brother Marco. Running a restaurant is hard. Opening one is even harder. In this series, we see so many disasters befall the team, the biggest being that their air conditioner breaks down, and you watch sweat literally pouring off the tips of the noses of cooks as they labor over a pot, and Gordon yells at them. It's not just that Gordon yells at his employees. He belittles them. His goal is not to fix the problem, it's to make himself feel tall by making others feel small. 
There's a famous scene from the opening service where a waiter comes over to the window to grab a plate, and Gordon notices that this skinny young waiter boy who is swimming in his father's suit is wearing a blue plaster on his finger. Plaster is what the Brits call a Band-Aid. This waiter had cut his finger, an extremely common event in restaurants, both in the front and back of house. This waiter had cut his finger, and he dressed the wound with whatever band-aid he could find, and it turned out to be blue. This made Gordon livid. He was trying to earn his third Michelin star, and the way that you get a third star is by making everything perfect. Not just the food, but the tablecloths, and the flowers, and the wine, and the silver, and the cheese board, and, of course, the service. Waiters should be dressed in their finest, and Gordon thought that a blue plaster would look conspicuous and cheap. He told the waiter to go get a flesh-colored plaster instead. Fair enough, right? I mean, it's a little insane, but hate the game, not the player, and Gordon was just doing what he believed necessary to earn that third star for the benefit of the restaurant and everybody who worked there. So fine. Tell the waiter to go get a flesh-colored band-aid instead of the blue one. But that's not what Gordon does in Boiling Point. Gordon will not let this poor waiter go. He will not shut up about the blue plaster. He goes on and on and on about how atrocious it is that anyone would even think that a blue plaster could be appropriate. The dressing down just doesn't stop. Stop. And it's all happening right in the middle of the service. Gordon really doesn't have time for this. His priority should be on running the kitchen. But instead, he prioritizes the, the little thrill that he gets by abusing a subordinate. Now, you could argue, and people have argued, that it was all a show. They argue that in Boiling Point, we are watching Gordon Ramsay the man invent Gordon Ramsay the media persona in real time. The bluster was for show. I don't really believe that. Because the Gordon Ramsay we see losing his shit in Boiling Point is not appealing. He looks gross when he's yelling. It's not the sexy, stylized yelling that he does on TV now. It's ugly yelling, with spittle collecting in the corners of his mouth and his face going bright red and puffy. It's not a good look. Chefs usually eat and drink a lot, and Gordon had gained a considerable amount of weight by the time we see him in Boiling Point. He's only about 30 years old, but he looks 45, at least. He's a lot more pudgy than we see him in any of his later series because he's not trying to be a TV star yet. He's just a man working himself to death, trying to build the finest restaurant in the world. Anthony Bourdain visited Gordon Ramsay not long after Boiling Point came out. Bourdain was making his first ever TV series, a cook's tour on the Food Network, Go and watch all 35 episodes of A Cook's Tour if you have not already done so. There is an episode where Bourdain flies to London and he eats at restaurant Gordon Ramsay and the two men obviously got along famously and remained friendly until Bourdain's death. Bourdain used to say that if you want to know the real Gordon, watch Boiling Point. That's as close as we ever got to capturing Gordon Ramsay the man on video. Bourdain said that ever since Boiling Point, Gordon has been playing a character based on his appearance in Boiling Point. And that character has since established itself as the archetypal fine dining chef in the minds of most people in the Anglophone world. They think of chef and they picture Gordon Ramsay belittling and abusing subordinates, all in the name of accomplishing what exactly? A plate of food? Is somebody starving? No? Well, then why is it such a goddamn big deal? Find your own lamb sauce, dude. Chill. Of course, Gordon would say that he only yells and browbeats in the pursuit of excellence. 
I call bullshit on that because it is now very well established in the restaurant industry that you can run a calm kitchen at the very highest levels. Thomas Keller, Eric Repair, you could go down a very long list of very famous chefs with three star places who are known for not yelling. Library voices, focus on the work, keep calm and carry on. That's a lesson that Gordon should have learned as a Brit. But he is a person of his times, as we all are. And Gordon came up in a more primitive, brutal era of the business when cooking was, frankly, less professionalized. And the kitchen was a haven for drunks and ne'er-do-wells and ex-cons and pirates and stowaways and traumatized veterans. Such people are going to blow up at each other when the tension rises. Now we live in a different world, a world Gordon Ramsay helped create, where chef is an exalted position in our society. Rich, high society parents are proud when their kids want to go to culinary school. Anthony Bourdain's parents were kind of ashamed. Now it's very different, and a higher level of professionalism has been achieved in the culinary industry, but Gordon didn't get to benefit from that back in the day, and he is legit scarred. Marco Pierre White's boot stamping on Gordon Ramsay's face forever. That craggy, boiled potato face. In essence... Gordon is no longer playing the role of chef on TV. He's playing the role of a chef from 20 or 30 years ago. That kind of behavior is increasingly not tolerated in high-level kitchens anymore. But the people who watch him don't know that. They just see a handsome, high-status man making endless drama for the cooks working under his leadership. And of course, it's television, so Everything ends up all right in the end of an episode of Hell's Kitchen or whatever. Beleaguered cook makes a mistake, gets behind. Ramsay verbally destroys the cook. The cook somehow recovers and the redemptive arc is complete when Ramsay flashes that beautiful rakish smile of his and gives the chef a pat on the back and an attaboy of some kind. And to the viewer, it looks as though this management style works. And God knows how much workplace abuse has been committed by bosses who attended Gordon Ramsay's television school of hospitality management. How many people have taken abuse in the workplace because Gordon Ramsay taught them to take it? Yeah, it's just TV. It's just a character. The internet is full of believable accounts written by self-identified low-level crew people on Gordon Ramsay shows, where they pretty much all say that he's a lovely guy on set. He tends to bust your balls a little, but usually with a smile on his face. I believe it. That sounds about right to me. I bet Gordon the man is a nice guy most of the time. But Gordon the character is a monster. And the monster is what people see on TV. TV holds up the monster as a paragon of leadership and indeed of masculinity itself. Burn that shit to the ground, I say. Who needs it? start over. The other out-of-date thing that Gordon does in his shows is make endless absolutist arguments about food, where he talks about the subjective qualities of food as though they are objective, which really means that he's asserting his own subjective experience of food as being the one true universal experience of food. And if you don't like what he likes, then it's because you have no taste. The only way to make gravy is X. That's the kind of crap Gordon Ramsay says in his shows all the time. And crap is exactly what it is. There are so many ways to make a good gravy. But for Gordon, it's not about gravy. It's about bravado. He must appear all-knowing, all-seeing at all times. And so everything he does on camera in the kitchen must have a reason. 
the only way to make a steak is if you put it in the hot pan and you do not touch it until you brown the first side. Yeah, that works, Gordon, but it's not the only way. You can flip the steak constantly. That might even work better. You can sous vide and then sear. You can start the steak in a cold pan and turn on the heat and you'll get an excellent product as long as you flip constantly and the steak isn't too thin. It's a big world with lots of proud culinary traditions and there are lots of good ways of doing the same basic thing in the kitchen. Gordon never seems to have learned a little trick that Marco knows and that I stole from Marco and have used extensively in my own work. And that trick is the power of today. Marco Pierre White is now old and fat and over it, and when somebody pays him enough to do a little cooking show these days, he kind of looks like he's still in bed, in a good way. Marco is no longer hostility masquerading as serenity. Marco seems genuinely serene, at least part of the time. And when he does a cooking show these days, Marco will say something like, you know, People often use a mixture of meats in a bolognese, but you know, today it's just beef. Beef is what we have, beef works great, so today we're making beef bolognese. That's what I mean by the power of today. It's, it's one tiny, highly economical word that you can add to a sentence that communicates so much. Today says, there's lots of good ways to do this. Here's the one that we're doing today. Without today, even the calmest, most unassuming instructional content can kind of bully you into thinking that there's only one way to do a thing. Because when you make instructional content, you feel a lot of pressure to explain yourself, explain your reasoning for doing what you do. And if you don't have a reason, you're tempted to kind of make one up. Guilty as charged. The solution is today. Today, we're going to debone this cut by taking the knife over here and blah, 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 blah. I do that all the time, and I stole it from Marco. Gordon should have learned that lesson from Marco. Another thing that I do in the same spirit is I say, my new favorite thing. When I'm really excited about a new dish or a new technique or something, I usually describe it as my new favorite X. That is a carefully constructed phrase on my part. Favorite is an absolute designation, right? Something is either the one thing that you value above all the others, or it's not. If it is, it's your favorite. If it's not, it's not. If I call something my favorite or the best, that's a really inflexible position. You can paint yourself into a corner by taking really inflexible positions on too many questions. You build this delicate house of orthodoxy around yourself. And when somebody points out an obvious flaw in the foundations, it all crumbles. I mean, Gordon says stuff on TV all the time that is simply wrong. Like he says that salting scrambled eggs in advance will make them watery. That is simply false. If you don't believe me, Believe Kenji. We talked about exactly this in my interview with Kenji from a couple of years ago. Rather than building a shaky logical case for the cooking technique that I am demonstrating in a video, I try these days instead to say things like, this is my new favorite way to make bread, indicating that I have had many other favorites before and I may have new and different favorites in the future, but right now, today, this is my new favorite way of making bread, and I'm, I'm so excited to show it to you. A real man's courage is to acknowledge that he doesn't know everything, and he doesn't have to. Real strength is in learning and in constant self-improvement. Real strength is in working with other people so that they can do the things that you can't do, and vice versa. Real strength is making the people that you work with feel valued and heard and supported. And if you don't value the people you work with, that's really your fault. You either should have trained them better or hired someone else. Or maybe they just really do suck and you need to fire them, but you can do that quickly and quietly, professionally with library voices. So that's why I find Gordon Ramsay, the persona, to be so objectionable. 
I am trying to be the counter-revolution to Ramsey's revolution. Ramsey made everybody care about food more, which is good. But now I'm trying to get everybody to chill the fuck up about food because, God, it's just food. Keenan Thompson, now the longest-serving cast member of Saturday Night Live, reportedly has this thing that he says to his colleagues when a sketch does not go very well or they biff a line or something. When you screw up on SNL, Keenan wraps his arm around you and he says, it's okay. It's only TV. It's not real life. Gordon Ramsay doesn't need me to forgive him his trespasses, but I do, nonetheless. I forgive Gordon for creating Gordon. I think fundamentally he's doing what most of us are doing most of the time, which is what we think we're supposed to be doing, what the people around us seem to expect of us. Gordon isn't a god. He's just a guy, born poor and anonymous. He found a shtick that made him rich and famous. People eat that shtick up, so he naturally concludes that it's a good thing, and he keeps doing it because we keep eating it up. Stop. Stop. Stop patronizing media that promotes and exploits and monetizes workplace abuse. That is a beast we should all stop feeding. I seem to have fed my beast one more time with a, another episode of the Ragusia pod in the can, as it were. Thanks for listening to it. Make good choices, particularly in the way that you treat subordinates. Today's subordinate is tomorrow's boss. Every high-powered media person who was mean to me when I was coming up, I remember exactly who they are and what they did. And when I became my own kind of big shot, I, I frequently came into contact with people who had been mean to me, and they didn't always remember me, but I remembered them. Make good choices. Talk to you next time.